Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another special edition of the show. I'm here in the bustling metropolis of High Texas, uh, <laughs> here at the William Chris uh, Winery. Um, this is a, a, a winery that I discovered recently and I wanted to come out and check it out because it seemed like they're making some interesting stuff and uh, like we talked earlier about being different, so I uh, definitely wanted to check it out. I've got Josh and Matt here, uh, Cellar Masters. Both, both, yes? I'm the Vineyard Master. Vineyard Master, Cellar Master, okay. And um, we're gonna talk about uh, some of the great wines here and about the, about the winery. And uh, why don't we go ahead and start with, uh, start with you, Matt. Josh, see, I prepped ahead of time and I still messed it up. Anyway, <laughs> why don't we start with you, Josh? Well, uh, I, I kind of stumbled upon this um, about two years ago um, I'd heard Heard good things about them. I was actually managing at the Salt Lake Barbecue. Um, they have 36 acres on site, and uh, we, they had sold the fruit to these guys um, to make the wine. So I came out with another manager, um, the vineyard manager, to taste through the wines, and I immediately fell in love with it. And I was like, you know, what do I have to do to get out of managing restaurants and get into that, that winery? Um, so I kind of pestered them until they hired me. Oh, nice, uh, nice. So that's you were telling me that's what I need to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, send, send emails until until they get tired of you, and you know, and it, they hired me right at harvest, and hoping that harvest would run me into the ground. And then I, 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 you know, and you said every, bring me more. Yeah, yeah. yeah I kept coming back. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, I don't think I could be a cellar master. I don't have that knowledge. I mean, I eventually maybe we'll get there in about thirty something years, but yeah. right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that's um, awesome, man. That's and, awesome. And being I was just in restaurants for seventeen years around wine, mainly fine dining. Um, have taken the level one psalm and was studying for the CSW certification. Um, and I, I knew a lot about the finished wines, right. the wines from all over the world. Didn't know anything about the, about the production part of it. And uh, you know, I was like, that was the next step for me is just to kind of go back to the roots and, and, and start from the beginning and learn more. And, you know, keep yeah. learning every day. Well, like we were talking before, before you started, that's kind of what I like to get out of coming here is learning about the production because yeah you can only see what's in the books and you can only uh, the finished wine but being able to come out and see the facilities you know yeah I took some pictures and right. and the, and the equipment is effectively always looks looks the same and and mm -hmm. but I still like taking the pictures anyway because it's there's, to me it's just part of the experience of of doing it um, how did you get into uh, coming over here uh, this is kind of a second career for me but um, I grew up in Fredericksburg so for me uh, William Chris is kind of the perfect place. It was it was some place that just kind of made sense. I was on the West Coast um, ever since I moved away, and I would come home for the holidays, drink the wine, see it improving over the last mm -hmm. ten, uh, especially five years ago to now. It's just incredible how everything has evolved. And um, William Chris uh, is a kind of an old world mentality in terms of the way the wine's made. Um, the culture, the place, is all part of. Uh, the, the way that the wine is, is thought about and, and the winemaking process very much takes into account um, this place and what kind of wine can be made specific to the soil, to the climate. Okay. And, uh, so that was important to me. So uh, this was one of my top, top places I really wanted to come and, and check out. And um, it's a great opportunity here in Texas right now. The industry is just exploding. The opportunity here is, is just wide open, so right. it was it was kind of a no-brainer for me to come home, be close to family, and get a chance to, to be a part of something big. So when you're out in California, were you also was that where you uh, started learning about the vineyards out in California? Was yeah, that... I lived in Northern California for a brief period of time, and then I also I lived in Seattle for a decade, and okay. um, so I got a little bit of exposure to everything, you know, um, and uh, so uh, I. I definitely always gravitated towards um, 
old world style wines. Um, I like um, this, the kind of things that you can do with wine here. I'm really excited about all of the secondary and tertiary um, aromatics that come out in the wines here. Um, it's just a really interesting place in the world. The, the stress that this climate puts on the on the vines is just incredibly mm -hmm. unique and um, uh, it's an opportunity to make a world-class wine um, that's completely different than anything else you'll find in the U.S. Awesome. Um, so um, why don't you talk about the, the name of the winery, where, where, the, where the William and the Chris came from. So it's uh, William and Chris, two guys, um, Bill Blackman and Chris Brunsrett. Um, Bill started in the early 80s. Um, he's definitely a farmer. Um, we like to call him the, the, you know, the old, old school Texas great cowboy. Um, planted his first vineyard in the early 80s and he's been at it since, you know, making wine, running vineyards, planting vineyards, consulting for, for vineyards um, in the high plains and here in the hill country. Um, Chris uh, was at school at A&M, changed his major um, once he found wine, um, and then graduated, um, started making wine down the road. Um, and Bill and Chris just kind of, they fell into each other's laps and we're like, hey, you know, like we both have the same philosophy. We both see the, you know, the wines and the Texas wine industry in specific um, go in the same direction. Um, so let's, uh, you know, let's get together and, and make something happen. And uh, you know, we, they made their first wines in 2008 um, opened up this tasting room in 2010, and we've mm -hmm. been going strong and growing ever since. Nice. Um, we also, uh, we're, we're, we're in the cellar, or the winery in the cellar room and all that. Uh, we were, I saw the new tasting room. Um, mm -hmm. You have that, you said there's basically on, on, on the weekends, it's, it's definitely definitely used, but you're, you're still doing some stuff with that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, we definitely have had a, a huge explosion in the last year of, of people actually coming to the winery. Um, and that's true of everyone along this stretch of highway here in the hill country. Um, uh, you know, our, our, the, the number of people following our wines through the club that we offer, the high society, and uh, just in general has, you know, it seems like it at least doubled, if not more than that, right. from the year before, you know. And uh, just in terms of being able to offer a quali high quality experience when they come out here, I mean, we're really interested in, in getting people into Texas wine. And part of that is providing them an, an easy, accessible experience. So uh, the new tasting room is, is part of just being able to be a little bit more uh, attentive to people when they come out here. Okay. Um, and then you, you talk about high society. So a great play in words, you know, high H-Y-E. Um, so kind of talk about the high society and where, what's going on with that. Well, high society is uh, our wine club. Uh, we are primarily a red wine house. We do a lot of Bordeaux blends. Um, and so we offer eight different um, bottles of wine in a quarterly shipment to people who are interested in, in keeping up with what we're coming out with. Mm -hmm. um, it's an opportunity for them to keep up with what's new here. Um, they get a little bit of a discount on the wine and um, they get first, first uh, pick at everything that comes out here because we are very boutique. We're not look ne looking necessarily to, to grow Case production wise, we're really interested in continuing to chase quality, and right. so um, that's just a, a way for them to ensure that they will get a chance to taste it because things do kind of turn over fairly quickly. A, right. One wine may sell out in three, four months, and then you'll be on to whatever comes next in terms of what comes ready in barrel as it as it ages. So. Okay, and then um, after that, we've got the high society. We were talking about your distribution. Um, it's most most of the sales are through that and through here, but then you also are in, in some selected restaurants. And we were talking about how you how you get into those restaurants. So kind of talk about the philosophy with that. Uh, well, <clears throat> a lot of it has to do with you know being me being in the restaurant industry. Chris was in the restaurant industry. Um, everyone loves to eat. We all find our our uh, favorite restaurants um, with really cool wine lists, but a lot of them are or wines that you can't get in other wine lists um, in the mm -hmm. city. Um, so we just really build a relationship with those restaurant, uh, the managers, the owners, the, the servers, um, specifically the servers. And right. So we, <laughs> They're key. So we, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we, we, we hand pick them, you know, it's a, what restaurants do we like eating at? That's where we want to, you know, right. have our wines. Right. Um, so it's really just, it's, you know, going out and finding, you know, if we, we go down to, uh, Last year we went down for a fishing trip in the coast and found a restaurant called Glow. We all loved it. And it's uh, Rockport. Rockport. Well, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I, I had I wasn't able to make it to the Glow, but next time I go to Rockport, they've got our wine. I, I will yeah, I will check it out yeah. because um, this this week this three day little thing was potential just trip back down to Rockport just to kind of hang out, but then I decided I really wanted to come out and, and hit the winery. So right, you know, but I'll uh, I'll definitely check out Glow next time I'm down there. Yeah, it's uh, really they do a good job. Nice, good job. nice, and and you know I like we had talked about it's it's good because you're you're going into places that you know your wine will be a good fit um instead of just right. going out and just saying hey can you yeah, put, put my wine in here we, you can put a wine <laughs> on any list really right you know and that's uh and i think it says a lot for um us and the restaurant if you know we go into a restaurant in austin um, and there's a few that we're the only texas wine on the list um and that really i think you know speaks volumes about us and about that restaurant and the, and the quality that they hold themselves to um, and the quality that we hold ourselves to and we both kind of fit and uh, you know, it's, a, it's a cool deal that'd be the only Texas wine on the right. list. That's cool. Um, so you've got uh, you've got vineyards here, you also got vineyards uh, north of Fredericksburg? North of Fredericksburg and Willow City, um, okay. Granite Hill, that's our main vineyard. We also have uh, about 30 acres uh, in the High Plains, Okay. Um, specifically the Hunter Vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, that, that one is an uh, old childhood friend of Bill's. Um, they both planted that together in the in the '80s as well, and Bill's been farming it since. And that's uh, so between those two vineyards, that's where we get the bulk of our fruit. Okay. Um, everything else comes from respected uh, vineyard growers um, and people that we really respect and have built relationships um, throughout the years. And so we have about three or four families that we okay. source from. And then uh, let's go over what what grapes are you uh, what grapes are you growing? Uh, here on site, um, we've got two acres of Malbec, an acre of Petit Verdot, um, and about three quarters of an acre of Tanat. Um, we are mainly a Bordeaux-inspired uh, red house, so we grow a lot of Cab, uh, a lot of Merlot. Um, Malbec is one of our most sought-after wines. Um, and then we buy a lot of uh, Rhone varietals, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Morved and Syrah. Okay. Um... So what do we uh, what do we have here that we're going to be uh, checking out? Uh, so we'll start with our orange muscat blend. This is Mary Ruth. Um, this is named after William's mother. Okay. Her name was Mary Ruth. She uh, loved orange muscat. Um, lost her just after opening. Um, so we will always do a blend in her honor of okay. orange muscat. Um, and then we go into Emotion, which is a Zinfandel blend. Um, it's a fairly young. It's a 2011, but uh, if it's any indicator. Of, of the vintage and, and the, the year that we had um, with yields low because of the heat and the drought. Um, it really made gorgeous fruit. Um, so we're excited about that 2011. And we have a Syrah um, that comes from down the road in Blanco, grown by Master Sommelier Guy Stout. Guy, I, guy, if you ever watch this, you're so freaking awesome. <laughs> Wait, seriously. He, he, he has one, maybe two acres, um, and we're the only people he sells to. He think, he thinks that highly of us, and we you think know, that highly of him. Too. I'm now happy because I, I knew he's had the vineyard, and I guess I just didn't do the research to who he sold to. Who he sold to. This is going to be awesome. This, yeah. is, this is a definite uh, Southern Rhone. I mean, I would okay. say it's gorgeous. It's not your typical Syrah, um, but if you're into Rhone varietals at all, this Syrah is right up your alley. Awesome. Cool and it's really drinking beautiful right now. Um, then we have our Hunter, which comes from the Hunter Vineyard in uh, in Brownfield. Um, and that's a blend of, it was a, uh, a vineyard specific blend until we the Cab is on its last leg. Um, so we blended in some Morvedra. Um, so it's a Merlot, Cab Franc, and Morvedra blend. Interesting, okay. Um, and then our, our pride and joy, our flagship is the Enchante. That was the first wine that Bill and Chris made together. Um, and it's a Bordeaux inspired blend. Um, four of the five noble grapes go into okay. this wine. Um, and then we have our uh, Jaquez. It's our port style um, fortified wine. It's a uh, black Spanish Jaquez, uh, Lenoir, all, all different names for the one grape. So. Okay, awesome. Um, so let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get started with the, with the first one. So Mary Ruth. There you go. All right, so this is an orange muscat. And... Orange muscat, Chenin Blanc, Grenache Blanc. Okay. So you definitely get the orange muscat off uh, on the nose. I think it jumps out, that mm -hmm. grapey uh, orange blossom. 
Um, but the Chenin Blanc and the Grenache Blanc together with that acidity and the minerality do a nice job of, of balancing it out. Um, I'm not a huge fan of orange muscats um, because of the normal style that they're made, but I, I drink this one all summer long. Yeah, it's uh, it's got a nice clean, fresh uh, bouquet to it. I even get let me a little bit of like a, of a almost like a sparkling honey out of it. It seems to even have kind of a kind of a sparkling wine mm -hmm. aspect to it. It's um, on, on the aroma, not, not not none of the bakery, none of the right, none of that stuff, but just the fruit type. It's really tasty. Good, good, really great acid on that. Perfect food wine. Yeah, um, yeah. I opened a bottle of this the other night. We had uh, made Thai food. Right. Oh, and cool. it, was, it was gorgeous. And this wine was actually uh, featured at James Beard this year. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jack Allen took this to James Beard, so um, it's definitely been in good company. And, and, uh, no, it's it's got it's got a great acid structure. I mean, um, if you're if you're into really good acid wines, this is something that would be great to have. Um, and the fruit, I mean, I still, for me, I personally still get kind of that honey, a little bit of the honey, but I also get some, some of that, um, almost, I would say a cantaloupe thing, mm -hmm. but, yeah, um, you, you know, bright melon. yes, honeydew, sort of. honeydew, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, that's my favorite of all the melons is honeydew. Yeah. Um, just freaking love that stuff. This is really nice. I like this a lot. Definitely like this a lot. To, to uh, winter, uh, Bill and Chris are actually in Lubbock right now, blending, working on blending, blending, this. blending the next one. 2012. Oh, a lot of our a lot of our whites um, that we get from the High Plains, we will crush and cellar in the white in the High Plains. Um, okay. And have Kim McPherson will watch after them for us, um, and then they they go up there and you know and, and blend it and bottle it and bring it back. Uh, Lubbock area is my next major destination at some point in time next year. Don't know when, but yeah, hit McPherson and all the folks up there. He's got a nice, nice spot. Awesome. All right, so, so this next on. one is Emotion. Emotion, okay. So it's a Zinfandel blend. Um, like I said, it's, it's still it's pretty young in the bottle. Um, it's 2011, so this saw about uh, eight months in oak. Um, okay. Somewhere around there. Um, we typically do uh, 12 to, to 14. On our barrel program, and we'll use French, American, and Hungarian. Nice, really nice. We do a, yeah. an even blend on uh, on everything, and uh, that's really the manipulation and the fun that we have with our wines. Because, as he mentioned earlier, that we are in that kind of old world philosophy that the fruit uh, and the vineyard is where the wine is made. Um, so once we get it in, there's no manipulation on our part, just adding yeast, um, maybe some acid adjustments, um, hand punch downs right. and open top bins. Um, so the fun that we have is playing with the barrels and right. moving, um, you know, say this cab out of this American oak, uh, if it's too oaky, we move it into European oak or French right. oak to tone that down. Okay. Um, and that we do that racking process two to three times a year. Um, and that's where we, we play and push the wine into Get those the balance of flavors from the oak itself okay so you, you, you mentioned hungarian so what 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 is that doing to the wine that the french and american doesn't do it's not imparting as much ar it's aromatic a fairly neutral yeah. okay um where american oak is a big bruiser um french oaks where you're going to get your uh, your your soft vanilla um notes and your round tannins mm -hmm. um and then the hungarian is is you know it's very it's kind of a it, it, plays back fiddle to, to the other two. Um, so it's uh, if something is almost just right or right where you want it, we can go into the Hungarian and, and it'll still be there six months later when we check on it. Okay, so it's not quite like having neutral oak, but it, but it's but it's, it's not. Still imparts, you know, it brings some things to Hungary is kind of like, and so French oak is, it, the, the wood grows differently than American oak does. Right. Right, and so Hungarian, it's, it's a similar oak, um, the genetics are similar to French oak, but without all of the kind of spice box notes that the French oak will give off. So, I get kind of a really uh, 
really like a meaty type of aroma off of it. You know, something something like a maybe like like a beef jerky type of thing, you know. But it's not it's not like it's in my face, but I kind of get that type of uh, sensation. Right. I would say, you know, with a little bit of the with a little bit of the red fruits too. Mm -hmm. This is a big seller for us every year, um, partly because it's it's different than the rest of our style. Um, we, do, we do this in a little heavier style, um, color wise, um, um, and partly because, <coughs> excuse me because of the label. Right. So these Bob are all Bob. these are all wine club members and uh, and, yeah. and friends of the family and uh, friends of the winery um, that kissed uh, uh, canvas basically and we made the label out of it. So, oh, this is so, too cool. It's a, it's a cool story. <laughs> um, this year we're actually uh, for Valentine's Day um, that weekend um, we're going to have some canvases here at the winery and you can come in, kiss a card, put it on the canvas, and maybe your lips will end up. If you well, I don't know, maybe not mine. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, right? They were well, that's, a, you. that's a that's a that's <laughs> a yeah. You you could have your lips on the label. Sure. There you go. Um, I I really I mean I first of all I'm, a, I'm Zin was. Probably the second grape I kind of really grew to love, but it was the grape that really got me into enjoying wine. Um, Syrah was the first one. It was the first grape that I felt like, man, there's something to this wine thing, you know. Right. There's there's something right. you know flavorful to, and not right. just something that I was like, I, I, I taste alcohol and it's grape juice, and that's about right. it, you know. Um, Zin was the first thing that really got me into it, and then um, and then from then on, it's it's been you know a lot of other wines, but. Um, Cap Franc is, is the current, my current kind of fave right now. Yeah, but. I went through a cap, my Cap Franc. The yeah. Chateau de Pop for me was, was the one that flipped the switch. It's like, uh -huh. there is something to this. And, <laughs> uh, and that was years ago. But yeah, that was the first one that I was like, you know, I worked at a restaurant, um, worked a, a banquet, and they had, there's like 15 people. Um, he had pre ordered all these wines, didn't drink all of them, said, here, take this home. I was like, all right, I'll take it home. I'll right. while I'm playing my video games or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like halfway through the first class, a video game was off, and I had my head, <laughs> my head was the glass. Just sitting there. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. That's nice. Um, I really like this. There's, there's a. I, I like the, the minerality to it, and you've got the pepper, um, mm -hmm. you know, and it's it's and it's smooth. It's not. It's it's right. um it's not a fruit bomb. It doesn't it doesn't attack you. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a good smooth wine. The tannins aren't out of control. You know, it's 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 not something like when you think of Zin. It's not something like you know something that's going to be in your face full right. full on. It's right. it's a little more subtle, which is nice. In Texas, versions of every varietal will be their own uh, distinct character. Right. Really, um, you're not going to grow Zin really far south in Texas. This is coming from Canadian which is a place that most people would never guess being so close to Oklahoma would make such a beautiful uh, fruit, but mm -hmm. um, definitely worth growing on its own merits. Absolutely. Nice. Very nice. Uh, let's get, let's move on to Syrah. Syrah. It's a guy, guy's guy fruit. Style. Guy's fruit. I'll definitely remember to say something to him at Texom next year. I can remember uh, the first year I went up there when I was doing the, the level one and they were doing all the, they are doing the, the two days of review. Mm -hmm. He was there for day one and uh, um, did, did, did his thing that he does. And then uh, we were near the end of the day and he was all excited because he had to come back down here the next day to harvest. Like he couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't put it off another couple of days. It's like, I'm going tomorrow, and then he was back the next day at the Texom conference, right. and he was just all aglow, and he had pictures yeah. of the tractor, <laughs> and just he was. It was that was my first experience uh, with with him, and, and he's been one of my favorites uh, ever since. Very cool. This is a really cool wine. Really, one of my favorites on our portfolio. And yeah, I mean, I can really see that old world style. You know, you, you're you're getting. You're, you're getting that, that farm barnyard type of thing, you know, and I really enjoy that type of stuff. And 
you know, there's a lot of minerality in the hill country, yeah. uh, soil content, you know, um, and you get both. You get both the mm, the baking spices on the finishes, but you do get that earthiness up front on the nose and quite a few of the wines. Yeah. Right. So they're they're very versatile. This is very tasty. This is, uh, we did, um, every Monday, I, I'm part of a sommelier study group, and a few weeks ago we did Syrah. Didn't, it could be old world, new world, but uh, you know, it was, it was, it was phenomenal to, to taste you know, all the different styles, whether it was from France or it was from Australia or if it was from the United States. Um, but you know, I, I, and, and I guess some days I like the old world, some days I like the new world style better, but you know, Syrah itself has just been a grape mm -hmm. that I've, that I sometimes forget I really like, and then I have some, and then right, I go, right. oh yeah, this is, this is what really started me. I keep saying Zin was what started it, but Syrah was the first one, you mm -hmm. know, to really get me, at least have some interest in wine, you know? Right. You know, I, can, I like how versatile it is in, in each climate. It pretty, can pretty much grow anywhere, and depending on where you grow it, you know, it brings a, a different flavor. Right. Um, and I think more so with Syrah than, than any other varietal. Um, you know, it's such a big difference from a, from a, a Syrah from the Rhone um, and a Shiraz from Australia and then a Napa, Cat, or Napa Syrah. Syrah. Um, and with this, you know, I, I get, I've, I've already talked about it the, the past um, couple days with everybody, um, and not, not all the wines have exhibited this, but um, this has that kind of, I, I kind of call it a Texas feel to it. There's, there's a, uh, on the palate, there's kind of like being out in, you know, being out in the woods, um, getting mm -hmm. that, that minerality, and mm -hmm. it makes me think of being out there, out in the in the Texas Hill Country or the Texas Brush or whatever, and um, uh -huh. I get that kind of feel, and and I don't tend to get that to this degree as I, you know, with other right. wines, you know, you, you'll get some of the same characteristics, but it seems to, I, what, and maybe it's because I know I'm drinking a Texas wine, right. and I get that, and I go, oh, it tastes like Texas. Well, I have a story that I tell about our flagship wine, Enchante. I grew up about 10 minutes from the vineyard, and whether I've psychologically created this or not, uh, when I when the wine opens up, because these wines, you know, they're very shy. Mm -hmm. You know, you really sit with the bottle with these wines. Like for me, that one, it reminds me I I drank well water, and so there's something about the minerality in that particular wine that reminds me of drinking water as a kid. Right. So I do think there is something really to this, the, the site specific aspect of old world wine, you know. Oh yeah. And the minerality that comes out in some of these wines, absolutely. And I mean, I can totally see, you know, this, this in particular is being something that if, if I wasn't, if I didn't know what it was, I would at least assume it was from Texas, you know. Um, I, I would think I would, I think I would get that feeling that I was drinking a Texas wine. I might convince myself it wasn't if I was drinking it blind, <laughs> right. but I, yeah. you know, but I would probably at least go if I find out it's a Texas wine, I won't be surprised and I'll actually be very happy about it. You right. know? <laughs> so um, no, I mean, I, I, and then that's something that I really like to have is you know uh, stuff that tastes like the place. Right. Um, discussed it, you know, many times where you know you can make you can make wine and it's you can make wine anywhere, but. It, you really to make the good wine is going to taste like it came where it came from. Right. That's, Absolutely. That was Bill and Chris one of the first days that I came. You know, they were, they made it adamant. It's like we're here to to make Texas wine and not just make wine in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we, we want we're we're big terroir chasers. Um, we very rarely blend um, high plains and hill country if we can avoid it. Right. Um, so we we're all about the taste of the land, and there's this you know there's story every bottle. That's right. I've said it many times. Every bottle has a story. Going to the wine shop, I go to the bookstore. Right. Yep. You know, <laughs> I yep. can spend hours just looking at the labels. Right. Uh, let's move on to Hunter. Hunter. Yeah. So this is our newest release. Um, again, coming from the Hunter Vineyard, Hunter Vineyard um, in Brownfield. The Hunter family and Bill planted this. Um, and if you know the High Plains, it's all cotton farmers. Um, they all ripping out, ripping out the cotton. Um, and planting vineyards, it takes a little less water to grow the vines than it does right. the even dry land cotton. Um, so this is an old old vineyard. The cab, um, which is on its last leg, might be ripped out this year. It was one of the oldest working uh, blocks of fruit in the state. Okay. I 
Again, minerality on it. This is such a cool one. Though. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It really is. It's so light as a Bordeaux blend, but yet right. it's so powerful. Because even just looking in the glass, you know, I wouldn't think of it as a Bordeaux blend. You know, it, it's it's pretty light. Um, I mean, I would never mistake it for Pinot Noir, but you know, it's definitely uh, definitely light. I even get like a little bit of, I guess, tobacco and maybe a little bit like smoke. You know. Yeah, a little Just bit. A I, get the, I get the tobacco. Yeah. Um, and I, I tend to struggle getting tobacco out of wine, and, and other people seem to like really get it, and mm -hmm. I sometimes don't get it. But you know, it was like it was like 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 cigarette, not not the smoke yeah, necessarily, not the, right? And not the dry, dry tobacco, but right. the yeah, really tobacco. moist wet yeah. tobacco. Yeah. yeah. One of those I could probably I could probably smell for a while. Which you know, smelling it a lot of times I think is underrated. Yeah, I think it's overlooked and. That's yeah, and that's when ninety percent of the fun we, for me. We, uh, smell in Texas. I mean, phenolics, the the chemicals that are giving out the aromatics. That's where we're really. I mean, in these hot years, we're going to be excelling at that. I mean, we'll never be California creating big old fruit bomb wines. Um, we certainly have some very fruit forward wines, mm -hmm. but in terms of what we really, what, what's unique about our terroir, I mean, part of it is just that the aromatics are so unique. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And this has got a good. This has got a good balance to it. You know, I'm I'm getting, I'm getting the minerality. I'm getting some of that fruit. I'm getting a little bit of that vanilla. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and and you're getting some of those spices in there. So you got a great balance of, of everything in there. You know, uh, tannins are are pretty good. I mean, they're they're about a medium. I don't know, medium medium plus maybe for for me. Um, I sometimes seem to like rate acid and tannins differently than other people. Some right. people think something's heavy and I don't think it is or the other way around but you know I really do feel it real right here in the gums um, but it's not like again it's not like I just got punched in the not mouth it's the mouth. yeah it, but it but it's there a nice nice bit of stringency yeah. it's, it's really nice and even then this is this has already changed a little bit it's something I do like to always mention when, when I get that out of a wine where after the first sip or after it's been in the glass for a little bit and mm -hmm. it's already changing after just a couple minutes. Um, it's been always nice. Really Most of our wines, because we are a, a small, uh, small lot production, um, most of they're young and for the most part they they don't last in the tasting room for over a year. Um, they're at people's houses and mm -hmm. so, um, you know, we recommend decanting um, for, for two reasons. One, because we don't filter. Um, so to, to you know, it might drop sediment over the years, but for two, I mean, they need a little coercing and, mm -hmm. and coaxing to mm -hmm. open up and do their thing. Um, and this is a perfect example of it. I, I decanted a, a bottle of this uh, for Thanksgiving. Um, decanted it when I first got there, and we right. had we had the dinner around six or seven, and it was gorgeous, and it was completely right. different. And I really. Not that I didn't like it before, but I was like, this needs some time in bottle. Right. Right. So like, now, so like, no, just give me a bottle in the canter and drink this all day long. Very nice. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, talk about it. You don't, you don't filter. Is it just this or, or all your wines? Uh, Most of your wines. The reds. Right? The reds, the reds the especially. Reds. We're really yeah. trying to hold on to that special, unique quality that, that's there. I mean, when you filter, sometimes you lose some of the magic. Mm hmm And I can see that. I mean, I, I've seen, I've, I've read about... You know, there's there are some some people don't think that filtering doesn't do anything, you know, doesn't hurt anything. And but I mean, I can see that if you're filtering it, you're you're holding something back out of out right. of the wine anyway. Not, how can it not? Some, alter something it? will the alter smallest, something. Yeah. The smallest bit, and, and sometimes I mean, I mean and sometimes that's the, for the that's part of the, the art of winemaking. And sometimes you can't taste what what it is that I mean. You make a small change, you have no idea sometimes how much that's going to change the wine over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, trying to make decisions uh, on a you know a split decision basis, where it's like, okay, how much are we going to do right now? Well, if you take an overcorrect or if you overcorrect, then you know things can drastically change. You know, um, so taking half measures. Working towards that is sometimes the, the way to go, and, and I think that's part of the mm, what you can't really replace experience-wise that Bill and Chris have is, right. is that they've been there enough where they've been able to figure out the, you know how much is a good idea 
you know, but really taking care, you know, we're re trying to make something that's, that's going to really stand out. And so you really take your time on those things, you know. Very nice. Uh, so what we got next? Enchante. 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 So this is our flagship, our pride and joy. Um, like I said earlier, first wine that Bill and Chris made together. Um, it's what we base this entire winery around is, is this specific blend. Um, this comes from Willow City, our main vineyard, um, Granite Hill. Okay. And you're using four of the five uh, Bordeaux? Four of the five Bordeaux grapes, um, a little uh, ruby cab in. Okay. But maybe 2%, 3%, 4%. So it's a Merlot Cab Sauv, Malbec, Cab Franc, and Ruby Cab. So we're missing Petit Verdot. <clears throat> the Cab Franc is really coming through for me. Mm -hmm. uh, just the, that, that, that pepper, uh, was it pyrazine? Yeah, is that the, yeah. I always forget the Yeah, I think it's the, the actual chemical. Right, right. You know, it's just... It tends to bring that up. And yeah. I just, you know, I'm always a fan of that. So <clears throat> at, the, at the 2012... Uh, Tech Psalm, one of the one of the seminars was all about Cap Franc, and so oh. I was in heaven. It was just like, oh, this is going to be awesome, right? And it was, you know, right. Cap Franc's another one of those grapes that's so different in, from you know northern latitudes to southern latitudes. Mm -hmm. We hit, we just you know sold out of a Cap Franc that had quite a bit of body to it for a Cap Franc. Um, still had beautiful aromatics. Um, they're just unique everywhere you make them. And I still, you know, besides besides the pepper, I'm getting that, you know, again, more minerality and earthiness out of it, you know. This wine has changed a lot from last year. Some of the toast on the nose. Mm -hmm. um, when you open up the bottle now, you tend to get a little bit of a tobacco box toastiness on the nose that wasn't there yet. And that's part of the, the wine evolving um, that was very fruit forward to begin with, straight out of, out of bottling. and. And now it's really starting to take on some of those Bordeaux characteristics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it. in many ways, I wouldn't, like, if, if we were, if I was blind tasting these, um, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I, I could see myself going into old world and going that direction um, instead of saying it's a new world wine. Um, you know, it's got some great old world characteristics to it. Um, but there's also that, I guess, I guess it's going to be that Texas twist to it, you know, mm -hmm. it's, right. it's, it's, and, and, and I've experienced other wines like that, that are done in an old world style, but you know, but when you, you sit there and think about it, it's not exactly old world. There's something different about it. And that takes you to another place. And right. I can see that with this, you know, I even, and, and even so when I was tasting it, I was even getting some, some cherry out of it, which I, I wasn't actually expecting that. I was expecting maybe something else, uh, fruit wise, but. You know, it's, it's got that, and it's also got that earthiness, and of course the pepper. Um, but yeah, this is this is a great blend. I really like it. Now, is there a lot of Cap Franc in this, or is it just no, it's, it's just, it's like just enough? Percent, I think. It's just enough that yeah. to really come through, huh? Yeah. This is my favorite so far, just so you know. <laughs> it 2011 is. to 2011. Oh man, if you like this, wait until um, we'll have that out after Christmas or around nice. Christmas and it's going to be a beauty. So uh, you were talking about your study group. Um, I, I do a study group on Mondays as well. I'm taking a break over the past couple months, but uh, we had just bottled the 2011, so there's no label on it or anything. Um, right. And we were doing Bordeaux. So I was like, hey, I'll, I'll take this one. and. Uh, it was maybe a three quarters of a bottle had been sitting um, just with the cork shoved in it for three or four days. Okay. Um, and I was like, oh, I'll put it in the bag, we'll pour it. And everyone was you know, going over it, trying to figure out, is it left bank, is it right bank? Uh, and I was just sitting there <laughs> laughing, <laughs> laughing, laughing. And uh, it was um, out, of the, out of the six wines we poured, it, uh, everyone liked it, you know, like third, I guess is what, okay. what we put it in. Um, and then we took it out of the bag and there's no label and they were like, so the 2011 is going to be it's outstanding. Nice. Very nice. All right, so uh, we've got the, uh, the Jacques. The yeah. Jacques. So Jacques is a, another name or one name for uh, Lenoir. The French call it Lenoir. Um, it's actually black Spanish. Um, 
grape or Jaquez or El Paso. Um, it's a grape that Spanish missionaries brought into Texas hundreds of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's stuck around. Um, does really well here, has a nice color, a nice fruit forward, but still a nice tannin structure. Um, and we, we use it to make this port style um, fortified with grape spirits and um, going to be something that we use for a Madeira soon. Okay. Um, so this is, it's not uh, as syrupy uh, as some ports can be. Okay. Um, it's still got a, you know, it's big up front and then it kind of coasts across your tongue um, and with a really cool finish on it. And it uh, I really like this. So like immediately, like, you know, my, my experience with ports isn't as much as work with other wine, but, um, you know, I, it, again, I don't really get an in-your-face, like, aroma that you get with port, you know, right. that really sweet type of that right. really, uh, aroma, which, you know, with ports, that's fine, you know, I, it, but, you know, I just, I don't, it's, it's a nice subtlety to it, you know, um, I can really get, like, that prune type mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, baked, you know, cooked fruit right. type of stuff, right. you know? Right. And there's a little bit of a spice on the nose that's mm -hmm. uh, sort of the varietal characteristic there coming through. And that's something like uh, over the past, really, I guess for me, a couple of years since I've really been getting into this, is Lenoir really seems to be like another one of those grapes that's really taking hold in Texas mm -hmm. as becoming like a Texas grape. Yes. You know, it, it's being, you know, it, it's one of those things where the the wine growers here or the grape growers here are really like, this is a, this is a grape we should really I mean, it's, it's resistant to. to a lot of the, you know, I think it's Pierce, Pierce's disease resistant. Mm -hmm. um, resistant to a lot of problems that we have here. So it grows perfectly, it's happy here, um, so why not grow it? Mm. I really like this. I mean, it's, it's it's got that, it's got a bit of sweetness to it, but it's not that it's not that syrupy type of stuff, right? right? You know, um, I, I kind of feel like I get like even again like a tobacco type of thing out of it. Maybe more like a, maybe more of a cigar box, but I, I get that also a sensation too yeah. um, uh, with it. But you know, it's it's really tasting very nice. This one's it's flying off the off the rack. It's really um, it's selling much better than I thought it would. Right. Um, even people that don't like sweets mm -hmm. and will pour it for them. Oh, you just try this, you know. And like, oh, I hate pour it. Oh, I can't stand pour it. Blah blah blah. Pour it, and they'll like, I'll take a bottle. Yeah, this one really, you know. I mean, I've I've enjoyed quite. Not to say quite. I've enjoyed a few ports, you know. Right. Um, but this really is 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 a, in a way, it could be a nice way to get somebody into port a little more. Right. Um, because you're getting all the characteristics, um, but it's it's got a nice subtlety to it, I think. Right. And you know, there's there's um, the, the, and like tasting it, there was like that spice aspect. And I think that's where I was getting that cigar box mm -hmm. or you know the tobacco thing. It was more of a more of the spices mm -hmm. coming through rather than just like a straight tobacco. But right. It's it's really nice. This is uh, a very nice one. Um, definitely. I mean. Well, any of these, obviously, I think you should. You, I mean, I like all of them, but um, you know, it's 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 a, you know, a, a must buy if you're if you're out here. Um, any of these, I would say, you want to get. You know, I've really enjoyed the Syrah. Um, really like you know the Enchante. You know, I like all of them to be honest. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 nice. You know, the old world style or or, or going into that is is a nice refreshing thing. Um, but, you know, I, I think, like you said, you know, with Texas, it's something that is really a good thing, right? Right. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. Because we're not trying to be California or anywhere else. Right. Right. And that's part of what you experience when you come out to high. I mean, this place still looks like an old town. Um, Bill and Chris were really, really um, wanting to emphasize the fact that, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're a culture here. And the wine is a reflection of that. And, and that's that's what our, our focus and, is. And it speaks, you know, it comes through when, when you walk through the tasting room. Um, it was the original house. Um, you couldn't see it because of the weeds were growing taller, mm -hmm. taller than the house. Um, they meticulously pulled every single board off the walls, numbered them, um, refinished them, and put them back up exactly where they were. Oh, wow. Same with the floorboards. Um, you know, it, uh, we, we try to reuse and recycle everything off the property. 
Um, the, there's tin um, on the ceiling in some of the rooms. Those were all from a turkey barn that was on the property. So uh, we, we really have fun with you know, reusing and recycling and making the place feel exactly like it felt 80 years ago, 100 years ago. And I hear it's haunted. It is. It is. Uh, <laughs> I was like, man, I, we finally I, got a good part where I can kind of bring that there in. It is. There <laughs> it is. I haven't personally witnessed it, but um, there is family cemetery on, on the property. Um, and we've had a few, uh, what was the society? Texas like Paranormal out. Society. Um, and then uh, what was the show? Ghost Hunters. Ghost, Ghost Hunters. Hunters. Yeah. Ghost Hunters came out and yeah. spent tonight. And, yeah. uh, and, and did they found thing. some ghosts? Uh, or did they say they did? Well, they found paranormal activity. How about that? Okay. Guys. Yeah. <laughs> Haven't heard anything back from them, so I don't know if that was right. a good thing right. or a bad thing. But you know, in the, in the settlers days, you'd have huge families. Some of the children would be, you know, stillborn. And, and so that's, that's the theory is that, you know, maybe some young spirits okay. still on the property. So when, when they were redoing everything and uh, they're pulling up all the floorboards, um, I had never heard of it before, but apparently to keep spirits away, you throw all your old shoes. Under really? The, under the okay, house. interesting. Yeah. So um, you found so there, was, there was about 150 pairs of shoes underneath the house. Oh my goodness. And then some of them were, were really cool. Um, Bill has some, and they're from, you know, from early 1900s, old leather children's shoes. That, uh, it was really, really cool when they told me that. That is, that is, that is absolutely interesting, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely wanted to get somehow fold into the you know, the cemetery right. thing and the ghost centers thing, um, but yeah, I mean, it's you know, you know, coming out to the property, um, it was it was really cool, you know, um, seeing you know seeing that stuff and hearing little stories about about it. Um, you, what was the what was the family name? The uh, Dykes. Dykes, yeah. Right. Um, you know, so if, if you're out here. Uh, Coming through the Texas Hill Country, you want to find a place to, to check out. You should definitely check out this place. Um, yeah, it's you know it's it's, uh, it's not that far from Fredericksburg. It's not right. that far from Johnson right. City. You know, um, you know it's, it's definitely a great stop, and, and I'm glad that I found it. You know, uh, when I was sitting there trying to figure out where do I want to go in the Hill Country, and I was like, and there was something about you know going to the website and and. and how everything was being done that was like this is a place I probably need to go to instead of you know other places not saying there's anything wrong with all the other places in Fredericksburg I mean they're all I mean I want to visit all of them at some point you know right. uh, and I got to see um, you know I got to see some other places I it's been a couple of years since I've been up here so there's other places that I went wait a minute that looks new um, so I need to think about that next time We're, you know yeah, there's a, growing it's growing like crazy it's yeah growing. You know, the word is out it, yeah, it's, sure. There's a new winery popping up every couple of months now. Right. right now, so, uh, and in terms of wine tourism sales, I mean, we're right up there with Napa now. So. Yeah. yeah. We're num number two as far as uh, visitor um, you know, numbers. Right. And second, just behind Napa. So there's something for everybody out here. You know? Yeah. And, and that's something to remember. I mean, uh, the subject has come up already, you know, in the tour, but it's just, it, it needs to be repeated is that if you are not in this, from this area, if you're outside of Texas, um, you know, you should come out here because it's 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 growing, and there's lots of great places out here to to uh, check out, and there's lots of bed and breakfasts to check out. Some of them, you know, um, uh, they're in Fredericksburg or elsewhere. I mean, all throughout the whole hill, hill, hill country, all the way up through you know west of Austin and all that. So um, you definitely need to check all this place, all these places out. Um, gentlemen, it's, it's been great tasting these wines. Um, really appreciate you taking some time out of your day yeah. to uh, to. Walk, walk through the vineyards with me. I got some pictures of that. Hopefully somewhere along the line, I've, I've put that into the video somewhere. I took some video of that too. Um, and getting set up in here, I mean, talk about a cool backdrop. Um, we, we got this set up, so I uh, really appreciate you, you doing that and, and accommodating me. Really, Our thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thanks it, Mark. for coming by. My pleasure. Folks, uh, we're going to wrap that up. I just, I, again, I uh, just want to thank everyone for stopping by. Uh, as always, make sure you click the links above. Uh, I've got links uh, for William Chris uh, Winery down uh, below and also leave any comments. Um, again, thanks for stopping by. We'll see everyone again next time.